Green Biogeochemistry at the University of Tasmania, and 34 co-authors for their paper entitled A Mesoscale Phytoplankton Bloom in the Polar Southern Ocean Stimulated by Iron Fertilization. And it was published in 2000 in the journal Nature. So this, was a, this award is for a paper in the aquatic sciences that's 10 years, old, 10 years um, of age or older that has had a major impact in the field and has led to fundamental shifts in re research focus. In this paper, the authors test how oceanic phytoplankton communities respond to iron fertilization, and it was in part inspired by the work of John Martin, in which he hypothesized that iron enrichment in high nutrient, low chlorophyll regions would stimulate phytoplankton growth, and which on a large scale could potentially mitigate global warming through carbon sequestration. And so while prior studies, uh, field studies, had documented increases in phytoplankton blooms, or biomass, following iron enrichment in the tropics, the second part of Martin's hypothesis, that the increased biomass would boost carbon sequestration, uh, remained untested until this study by Boyd and others. Their study found that while iron enrichment led to an increase in phytoplankton biomass and photosynthesis rates, the increased carbon fixation was not necessarily followed by enhanced carbon sequestration as predicted by Martin. And this paper highlights not only the sustained impact of iron fertilization on phytoplankton production over several weeks, but it also, also that the controlling factors and processes of iron-enhanced primary production are more complex and variable than was predicted by the iron hypothesis. The papers had a lasting impact not only on aquatic science, with more than 1,400 citations, but it has also been a central work, or a central, yeah, a central work to policy discussions on the controversial idea of ocean iron fertilization for climate change mitigation. And unfortunately, Philip could not be here to accept the award in person, but he's put together a video presentation for the plenary that we'll view now. Good evening, uh, Philip Boyd here uh, in Hobart in uh, Australia and obviously a long way away from uh, where you're having the ASLO meeting in, in Puerto Rico and regrettably uh, I'm not able to be there in person this evening to represent the Soiree team to accept this award from ASLO. The team were particularly thrilled to uh, be uh, awarded the, the John Martin Award because much of what I'll tell you about this evening with respect to the Soiree study uh, in the Southern Ocean and the subsequent uh, publications and research that arose from the Soiree work, uh, in particular into the debate around the pros and cons of marine geoengineering, really I think are, are themes that uh, the, the late John Martin was, uh, was very passionate about. And so this evening, uh, for a few moments, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some of the, the uh, story on Soiree, and I'm going to actually start then with the backstory for Soiree. The backstory uh, on Soiree then is, uh, is very interesting, uh, and you might be a bit surprised in this uh, next slide to see Nelson Mandela uh, uh, and what's he got to do with Soiree. Uh, he clearly wasn't on the ship. What was interesting, uh, about the uh, inception of Soiree was that uh, uh, President Mandela, uh, when he came to power, uh, wanted to thank many of the countries for their staunch support against the, the previous uh, regime and its, uh, its apartheid policy. And New Zealand was one of those countries, and so we were actually offered the use of the South African polar research vessel, Agulhas. Uh, the Agulhas uh, we had planned to use and had put in a proposal uh, then to conduct the first large-scale uh, iron enrichment study in the Southern Ocean. Unfortunately, as things uh, played out uh, with some politics uh, that I won't go into, uh, in the end we didn't get the, the Agulhas vessel. Uh, and just when I was sort of resigning myself to going back to doing more lab work on iron enrichment studies, uh, I bumped into our research director at NIWA, Rick Pridmore, 
Rick almost casually said, uh, maybe you could uh, uh, take our boat, as if he was talking about a 30 meter yacht for the weekend, when in fact, what he did was he let us have the, the Niwa research vessel uh, Tangaroa, which is over 70 meters in, in length. And he gave it to us without having to write a proposal. There was, of course, one, uh, one little uh, bit of small print he mentioned as I was leaving his office. He said, uh, oh, and by the way, don't stuff it up, or words to that effect. So uh, no pressure then uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the soiree study. And so the soiree team uh, in this photograph you can see taken in, uh, in Fiordland uh, on our return from the soiree voyage uh, in the South Island of New Zealand uh, uh, really came together uh, uh, very, very smartly. And uh, I was quite amazed in actually putting this presentation together to, to sort of recall just how many disciplines we managed to squeeze onto the ship. We had scientists from New Zealand, from Australia, from the US, from Canada, from the UK. But if you have a look at this slide, you can see uh, we have many different other disciplines uh, uh, on board the ship. In addition to doing the sulfur hexafluoride tracking and the, the iron release, we had physical oceanographers, chemical oceanographers looking at iron uptake uh, in terms of the biology, photophysiology, looking at particle export, looking at zooplankton grazing, microbial processes, never mind a whole study in terms of uh, some of the biogenic gases like nitrous oxide and dimethyl sulfide. So we really had a, a lot of stuff going on, on on board the ship and we had a really great sort of group dynamic on board, which was just as well uh, because of course it took us almost uh, six days to get down to the site leaving New Zealand. Uh, on our way down we had to uh, run through seas in the, uh, the roaring 40s, the furious 50s and the screaming 60s quite often shipping green water uh, onto the main deck of the ship and, and one or two people went for uh, an inadvertent body surf uh, uh, down the back deck, uh, which uh, was, was pretty serious at the time. Uh, on reaching uh, the sort of locale, uh, we had already done quite a bit of homework uh, into this. We'd done a pre-site survey and had tried to locate the, the, the sweetest spot to actually do the experiment. This involved having a look at the broader Southern Ocean. We wanted our work to be representative. And so we wanted somewhere uh, in polar waters around about two Celsius uh, with a mixed layer of around, uh, around about 60 to 70 meters. Uh, you can see then from the, uh, the, the, the mixed layer here in this, uh, the bottom right hand part of this slide that we did pretty much hit our target. We had a 65 to 70 meter mixed layer. Indeed, some people on board the ship expressed concerns that maybe it was too deep, that even with the addition of iron, we wouldn't actually see a bloom, but it was representative of the conditions. The other thing we found then was using both active fluorescence uh, and also this flavodoxin technique. You can see these, uh, these, these cells are lit up uh, because they've got flavodoxin in them. So we had, we had a population of anemic diatoms that we hoped then would respond to the iron addition. So we set up our chemistry set on board the ship. We had uh, a number of metric tons of, uh, of uh, an iron salt on board. Uh, we also had to, to, to mix this up into 10,000 liter containers and acidify it to make it dissolve. We also then added uh, sulfur hexafluoride, just a few grams of this to actually allow us to be able to track the patch. Uh, you can see we have scaffolding on the ship uh, around the tanks and indeed, as we, as, as we started to lay out our iron and sulfur hexafluoride uh, labeled patch of water, uh, the seas built up to around about 10 meters. So uh, it, was, it was a pretty hairy exercise. But again, you can see then in this slide in the bottom right, we ended up with a coherent patch uh, uh, of iron labeled water. And in the subsequent slide here, we can see then the evolution of this patch uh, in, in the upper panel uh, panels. We have the sulfur hexafluoride uh, from the start through to about day 12, uh, day 14 was the end of the experiment. And then we can also see then how the, the high areas of sulfur hexafluoride correspond in the, in the, the central uh, series of panels to increases in chlorophyll going up to about two milligrams. So a substantial bloom uh, confirming one of the tenets of uh, John Martin's iron hypothesis. And then in the lower panel, you can see the drawdown of carbon dioxide uh, rising to about uh, 30 to 40 uh, uh, microatmospheres. So again, we're seeing a bloom and a marked drawdown of carbon dioxide. 
When we look at a sort of a vertical slice through the water column, we can see down in our 60 to 70 meter mix layer, we have a very clear demarcation as we move from left to right across the slide. This increase in the photosynthetic competence, FV over FM, from low values to values close to the maximum of 0.65 in the center. And in the lower panel, again, you can see a very marked contrast over 20 or 30 kilometers in terms of the, the amount of particles with much, much more particles associated with the bloom. There's obviously not time to go into all of the, the various uh, findings of Soiree, but I just wanted to focus on a couple. Uh, in this slide here, we can see then the very interesting uh, links between ecology and biogeochemistry. In the upper panel, we can see that we did see uh, an iron-stimulated bloom of phytoflagellates uh, that took off. Uh, they were able to bloom because the resident microzooplankton, the heterotrophic nanoflagellates, were too small to graze them. But you can see after day 10, they get reeled in by this uh, increase in the number of heterotrophic ciliates. If you look in the, the, the lower panel, then we see a corresponding signature in terms of the sulfur cycle with an increase in uh, the particulate DMSP pool, and then a rapid transformation to uh, dimethyl sulfide once the heterotrophic ciliates graze the, uh, the, uh, the phototrophic uh, autoflagellates down. And so I thought to, fit, to finish uh, this short presentation, I'd try and give you some sense of what it was like to be down there. Uh, in the slide, we can see the view from the bridge of a ship. We're looking out, uh, as, and as far as the eye can see, if not beyond that, we've played King Neptune. We've actually uh, changed the biogeochemistry by adding iron and influenced the carbon cycle, the sulfur cycle, uh, and uh, other, other cycles of nutrients. It was quite a, an eerie feeling that looking out, uh, again, as far as the eye could see to the horizon and knowing that we had actually done this large perturbation, uh, large enough to be seen from space. And indeed, we could see it from space in this monthly composite from March 1999. We can see the distinctive C or sickle shape of the soiree bloom. Uh, in the right-hand part of the panel, you can see then uh, it's in stark contrast to the background HNLC waters with their much lower levels of chlorophyll. And so we were a little bit puzzled then when we saw, saw these images about why the, the bloom actually took on this distinctive C or sickle shape. Indeed, when we got back and we had uh, a series of images, uh, we decided to look and see what was the fate of the patch because unfortunately we had to leave it uh, while the, the bloom was still cooking up. Much to our surprise, we saw that the bloom was, was still evident uh, much long, longer after we'd left. Uh, so. Uh, day 20 into day 30s and into day 40s again because of this conspicuous background we can pick out the filament uh, of this patch right through to day 50 what was going on and when we compare it in the in in, in this next slide then with a, a conventional polar bloom this is one from the u.s jagoffs program from mark abbott's bioptical moorings we see this bloom peaks after about 20 days uh, and falls away it's classic textbook stuff Whereas uh, the soiree bloom, uh, based on our measurements up to day 14 and then extrapolated with the satellite, is going well after 50 days. And it turns out that the explanation, both for the longevity of the bloom, but also this distinctive C or sickle shape, is actually due to an artifact. And that is the, 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 uh, the patch we initially labeled was around 50 square kilometers. By the end, it was over a thousand. So it was actually entraining water in uh, from the outside. And this entrainment was taking place because the, the patch was being squeezed uh, in, 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 uh, in one plane and uh, being strained and rotated in the others, which gives us this distinctive shape. Uh, and, and so really, this is what we termed the soiree chemostat because just like a chemostat in, in the lab culture, where you, uh, you set a dilution rate to, to, to pump out the, uh, the growing phytoplankton cells and you then also introduce more nutrients, this is what was happening in Soiree. We had a chemostat and uh, this really, I think, was the, the, the biggest take home or the biggest shock for me was that even something that we could see from, uh, that we, we could see from space that was over a thousand square kilometers, one of the largest marine manipulation experiments that's been carried out on the planet, that they were prone to artifacts. And so this led us then to do some modeling work with George Jackson at Texas A&M, just to look at the question about why we didn't see any change in the amount of particles being exported uh, out of the base of the mixed layer. 
And from George's modeling work, you can see in the slide that when we turn the dilution off, we do indeed end up with a, a very different particle dynamics and we start to get coagulation of the cells. And that's why we didn't see uh, any export or any increase in export, even though we had played King Neptune. You can see, again, the view from the bridge of the ship over a very large area of the Southern Ocean. And so just to finish my presentation, uh, you know, the take home from this was that we really had to go to some warmer waters, maybe in the subpolar or the subtropical HNLC ocean, uh, somewhere where when we added on the gross rate of the cells would actually exceed that of the, the dilution rate so that we could, we could break out of the chemostat mode. It took us a few years to do that, but in the final slide you can see that uh, we did this work uh, near Ocean Station Papa in the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, in the subpolar waters, the cells didn't grow faster. And you can see in these two satellite images of this 1,000 square kilometer feature, the series bloom, that between day 19 in the top left and day 24 in the bottom right, we do actually see that the bloom is suddenly a pale shadow of its former self. A lot of the biomass has disappeared. And what we have here then is uh, some of the, uh, the first opportunity to really look at how iron enrichment changes the export properties of a bloom. So once again, I'd like to thank you uh, for your attention. And again, uh, it's a great honor on behalf of the Soiree team to receive the, the John H. Martin uh, Award from ASLO. Uh, thanks and good night.